If you have your Bible, and I hope you do, I want you to open this morning to the book of Acts, chapter 17. We're actually beginning a new series this week that will take us all the way to Christmas. We're going to be looking at the book of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, this is one of the earliest letters written by the Apostle Paul to the churches, the first letter that he wrote to the church at Thessalonica. And uh, we're going to actually begin by looking at Acts chapter 17 and seeing where this story starts. As I was thinking through this series and as I've been reading through the book of First Thessalonians, I was thinking about the number of churches that Marianne and I have been a part of, or that I've been a part of in my life. Churches that I've been a part of for at least two years or more. I don't know how many would be on your list. Just think back to when you were born. How many churches have you been in that you were there for at least two years? I added it up. We have There are eight on my list. When I was growing up, I was in three different churches in the town that I grew up in. And then uh, when Marianne and I got married, we were in a church for five years in Tulsa. And then we were in a church for seven years in San Antonio. We've been here for 22 years. We've been in three churches here. So it's a total of eight churches that we've had at least two years of being in those churches. Uh, eight very different churches. In fact, what what made me think about these churches is as I was starting to dig into this letter from Paul to the Thessalonians, I thought, which of the eight churches that I've been in would be most like this church in Thessalonica that Paul wrote this letter to? If I was going to write a letter to the eight churches that I've been a part of, which letter would sound most like 1 Thessalonians? There are, there are 13 letters that the Apostle Paul wrote in the New Testament. He may have written more than those. We only have 13 of them. He wrote 13 letters. He wrote seven to seven churches, nine letters to seven churches, because he wrote two letters to the Corinthians, two letters to the Thessalonians that we have. He may have written more than those, but we've got those. And he wrote four letters to three people, Timothy, Titus, Philemon. He wrote uh, two letters to Timothy, one to Titus, one to Philemon. And when he wrote to different churches... He wrote with very different messages, very different objectives in mind, because the churches were very different churches. So when Paul wrote to the church at Rome, the letter that he wrote to the church at Rome was a church that, or it, it was a letter that was full of theological, doctrinal, systematic teaching, because he knew that that church needed that foundation of theology poured underneath them. They needed to understand the doctrine of sin, so he lays that out. They needed to understand justification by faith, union with Christ, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They needed to understand the relationship between the uh, nation of Israel and the new church, and they needed to know what sanctification should look like in their lives. So he spelled it out in this masterful letter to the church at Rome. And I can think of churches I've been a part of that if, if I were picking the letter to send them, I'd send them Romans because they need a theological foundation poured underneath them. They, they need to get back to that, that basic truth. Uh, and then I was thinking about the, the Ephesian church and the Colossians church, Paul's letters to the Ephesians and the Colossians. They needed the same kind of instruction that the Roman church did. They needed a better understanding of God and his purposes and plan. They needed instruction and the implications of that for their lives. In fact, let me just, I would say, I would suggest that in our day, uh, there, are, there are churches that want to emphasize the practice of Christianity over the theology of Christianity and say that one matters more than the other. I think those folks ought to go back and read the epistles in the New Testament. Because the Apostle Paul, when he was writing to churches, made sure that he poured a theological foundation underneath them before he talked to them about what the practical outworking of that should look like. He always began his letters to them, <clears throat> excuse me, either by stating or restating core theological truth, truth about who God is, about God's purposes, before he ever talked to them about what the outward living of that should look like. And I, I can think of churches, again, that I think could, could uh, benefit from a healthy dose of the letter of the Romans, or the letter of the Ephesians, or the letter to the, the uh, Colossians. Now, you think about the letter to the Galatians, and I'm not going to go through all of them, okay, just so you can relax here, but you think about the letter to the church at Galatia. This was a church that had lost an understanding of the gospel. They'd gotten confused about the gospel. People had come in and had told them that in addition to the work that Christ had done on their behalf, they needed to add to that Jewish ritual and law in order to be pleasing before God. And Paul wrote to them and said, 
you've lost the central issue of salvation, which is that we rest completely on the finished work of Christ and we add nothing to it. And so he sent a rebuke to them because they were drifting toward legalism. And I can think of churches I've been a part of that I'd send that letter to. Because they are churches that, and, and this is the case I think with a lot of the hyper-fundamentalist churches in our day, that want to add tradition or want to add a list of do's and don'ts to the finished work of Christ to make a person acceptable before God. Now hear me, I believe that God calls us to holiness, but there's a big difference between responding to God's work with holy living and having a list of do's and don'ts that make you acceptable before God. The Galatian letter addresses that, and there are churches today that could use a letter like that. But when I got to the book of 1 Thessalonians, I thought to myself, if I were going to send a letter to Redeemer Community Church, this would be a letter I'd send to them. And, and I hope to show you why that is this morning and over the next few weeks as we go through this. Let me, let me start with some context for this letter, and to do that, it always helps me to get geographically oriented to where we're talking about, so I hope you're okay with a map, because uh, I'm going to ask Megan to turn off the lights and put up the map. Okay, here is Paul's second missionary journey. Starts down here in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Coming out of the Jerusalem Council, Paul, together with Silas, move up to Antioch, and Paul, through Tarsus, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and Troas, this is the area of Asia Minor, this is where Paul went on his first missionary journey. So he's going back through and he's strengthening the churches that he planted in his first missionary journey. He's in Troas up here. That's when he gets the vision. You remember the story? He gets a, he gets a vision in the night, a man from Macedonia who says to him, come to Macedonia, we need help. And so Paul, who had planned to stay in Asia Minor, gets on a boat with his team and they go through to Neapolis, Philippi, Amphipolis, Apollonia, Thessalonica, Berea, and, and that whole area. This area up here that says Thrace up there at the top and Macedonia, the ancient world, that's where Paul went to. This is modern day Greece and Turkey up in this area. But you see those, uh, the three fingers sticking down? Uh, Thessalonica, right up there in the corner, is, uh, is a seacoast city in a, in a nice harbor area off of the Aegean Sea. Uh, I'll just I'll point out to you that Philippi and Thessalonica, Paul went from Philippi through Amph uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia to Thessalonica. It's about a hundred mile journey from Philippi to Thessalonica. And uh, we're going to read what happened in Acts chapter 17 and then we'll come back here to the map. Thessalonica, as I said, <clears throat> thank you Don for this, Thessalonica was a seacoast town, a port city, it was along a Roman road called the Via Ignatia, the Ignatian Way, a Roman road that was constructed in the second century BC, which came across Macedonia. It, it actually connects uh, Albania with Istanbul in Turkey, about 550 miles along through the northern part of uh, Greece and into Turkey. Uh, and, and so this Roman road across the north and this seacoast city come together, Thessalonica, making Thessalonica a leading city for commerce in the ancient world. In fact, in Macedonia, this was the second largest city. Actually, in Greece, this was, this was the second largest city, probably a quarter million people living in Thessalonica. It's about the same size as the metropolitan, or not the metropolitan, but the city of Little Rock. So Thessalonica had as many people in it as Little Rock does, okay? Paul visited Thessalonica and planted the church there. The details of that are in Acts 17, so we're going to read that together. Before we read it, let's uh, ask God to grant us the grace of illumination. Pray with me. Open our eyes, God, we pray, that we might see wonderful things in your word. Grant us grace to understand your word, grace to believe your word, grace to respond to your word with faith and to obey your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. Read along with me. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, 
explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men out of the rabble, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, that is Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them. They're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king, Jesus. The people of the city, or and the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they'd taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived there, they went into the Jewish synagogue. We'll stop there. May God add His blessing to this reading of His Word. You get the picture, right? Paul and Silas. By the way, Silas is also known as Sildanus. Same guy. They just two different names for him. Paul and Silas, along with Timothy, who's on the missionary team, they arrive. They're, they're part of the traveling party. They get to Thessalonica. They follow what was Paul's common practice. They go into the synagogue. And Paul comes in. He's a rabbinically trained Jew. He comes to Thessalonica. As you might imagine, they said, give us news of what's going on. You're, you came from Jerusalem. What's going on back in the homeland? We want to know what's going on. Paul says, well, thank you for the opportunity. I have a lot I'd like to tell you because there's a lot going on. And he began to reason with them that the Messiah had in, in fact come. Now, <clears throat> these Jews in Thessalonica were thinking like, common Jews in that day would think. If the Messiah is coming, or if the Messiah has come, then he should be established as the king of Israel. He should lead a mighty army. He should free us from Roman oppression. And we should see the golden age of Israel return as it was in David's day. One greater than David should have arrived. They were expecting a political, military, ruling king to be the one who would come. So here comes Paul. He says, the Messiah has come. And he says, and here's what happened. He didn't take over as a military ruler, a political leader. He suffered, was crucified, died, and was raised again. But Paul says, let me show you. The Old Testament said that was what was going to happen. So he reasoned with them and proved to them in the synagogue from the Old Testament scriptures that this was, in fact, God's plan for the Messiah and that they had misunderstood it. That's what he did for three successive weeks in the synagogue. Now, we don't know if that means three successive Saturdays, or if there were additional meetings going on at the synagogues. Well, we don't know how often they would come together. We don't know if when they would get done with work, they'd go to the synagogue to hear more from this person who had come through. So we don't know exactly how many lectures Paul had on this subject. But over a three-week period, he laid out his case for the fact that the Messiah was different than they thought the Messiah was going to be, that in fact he had come, that he died, and he was raised again, and that that's what the Old Testament taught was going to happen. Now, at the end of this three-week period, some of the Jews believed, and many of the God-fearing Gentiles who were coming to the synagogue also believed, and not a few of the leading women in the community who were also coming to the synagogue. Now, let me answer a few questions that might come up for you here. First of all, was Paul only in Thessalonica for three weeks? He only was there in the synagogue for three Sundays, it says, and then the riot happened, and then he was kicked out of town. So some have thought that his time in Thessalonica may have been three to four weeks long. That's possible, but I think it's unlikely. If, if in fact, that's what happened, that three to four weeks was a three to four week period of an intense reviving work of the Spirit in Thessalonica. For, for a church to get planted in three or four weeks that becomes a rooted church, for these people to hear and embrace the gospel in, in a three to four week period, this would have been a, a deep work of the Spirit. And again, it's possible, but here's why I think it's unlikely. Uh, 
I think because of the nature of the love relationship that Paul expresses in 1 Thessalonians with this church, it just sounds to me like there was more time, more investment, more bonding that took place. But beyond that, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 16, when Paul's writing to the church at Philippi, he commends them for their financial support of his missionary efforts. And he says, even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. So what that indicates is that when Paul was in Thessalonica, he got a couple of offerings at least from the church at Philippi, which means he had to be long enough there long enough for them to know he had a need to get the money back to him and then to get the news that he still had more need and get more money back to him. There's, there's just, it could have happened in three weeks, but I think it's more likely that he was in the synagogue for three weeks and then that over a three to six month period, the church was formed with these Jews who had been converted these God-fearing Gentiles and these leading women, they started meeting together, probably meeting in Jason's house. Jason, who's in this story, we don't know much about Jason, but they probably met at his house. He was probably a wealthy man because he was able to post bond. When, when the trouble came up, he was able to, I don't know if it was bond or a bribe, but he was able to say, look, we'll make sure if there are any damages, here's the bond to cover it. So he had the money to spare to do that, probably had a big enough house. He was probably housing Paul and Silas and Timothy while they were there, and the church was probably meeting in his house. So I think that probably went on for three to six months. Let me explain a little bit about these God-fearing Gentiles uh, who would have been coming to the synagogue. These were men and women in the city of Thessalonica who were probably disillusioned by and fed up with the pagan practices of the Thessalonians. They, they saw the pagan morality and the pagan deities, and they looked at it and they said, that, this cannot be right. We don't believe that this worldview is the right worldview. And they were attracted to Judaism by the monotheistic uh, and, and highly moral code of Judaism. So they would come to the synagogue to hear about Yahweh, about the God of Israel, the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth, the Father God, who was the Father over everything. They would come to hear about that, and they would come attracted to the ethical and moral uh, uh, teachings of Judaism. Now when Paul comes in, and, and shares the gospel. Messiah has come, it's Jesus. We, we just have to acknowledge here, with, with God-fearing Gentiles, Paul had an unfair evangelistic advantage because he came in saying, the God of Israel, the one true God who you've been hearing about, he is the one true God. He has sent the Messiah and, and uh, the Messiah has suffered and died and, and uh, the gospel is being preached to all. The ethnic component of Judaism was eliminated in the gospel. In fact, here was a Greek-speaking Jew. He was a rabbinically trained Jew, but he was also a Roman citizen, coming with a Greek convert, Timothy, coming to town. So it was clear that this missionary team was not just a bunch of nationalistic Jews. These were people who were from, from all parts of the world who were receiving the gospel. So all of a sudden, the nationalism that might have kept some of these Greek-speaking Gentiles at arm's length from becoming Jews, that was removed. And the other thing is, Paul comes in and says, the Jewish law has been fulfilled in Christ. And, and so you can be acceptable before God without having to keep the Jewish law. That means you don't have to keep the ceremonial law. That means you don't have to get circumcised. Okay? All of a sudden, the Greeks are saying, we have, we've been attracted to what Judaism was teaching, but but we were a little put off by some of these things. This is the God we want to worship. And Paul says the Messiah has come, and this is why it's true. So these people were, they, they were ripe for the gospel. They had been preconditioned to hear the gospel because of what they'd heard through Judaism. So this new church has some appeal. And in verse 5, it says, when the Jews realized that the congregation of, that was meeting at the synagogue had just shrunk, when they showed up that fourth week and half of the folks were there, including most of the Greek speakers were gone and most of the, the leading women were gone and a, some of the Jews had gone, they looked around and they got jealous. They were not happy with what had happened. So they decided to respond with trumped up charges of sedition. 
they said they, these men are acting against the decrees of Caesar. They're saying there's another king, Jesus. And this is also where Paul and Silas and Timothy are described as the men who had turned the world upside down, is in this passage. News of what had happened 100 miles up the road with the demon-possessed fortune-telling girl who was delivered from that, and with the, the beating and the jailing of these men, and then the earthquake that had opened up the jails. They, this news had traveled along the Ignatian Way. So that by these people in Thessalonica had heard what was going on. When Paul and Silas show up, they, they show up with a little bit of celebrity because they'd heard what had gone on up there. So they, uh, they, they, these are the men who had turned the world upside down. Jason has them in their home. When the, when the trouble erupts, Jason goes and settles things with the authorities. And then Jason and the others say to Paul and Silas, you need to leave town because it's, the heat's going to stay on as long as you guys are here. And so put the map back up, if you would, Megan, just so I can show you what happened. So they left Ber uh, Thessalonica, went to Berea. You remember the noble Bereans who searched the scriptures? They went to Berea, and from there they took a seacoast route down to Athens. Paul was in Athens, that's where Mars Hill happens. And then to Corinth, and he's a year and a half in Corinth, um, where he he establishes the church at First Corinthian or the Church of Corinth, yeah, Corinthian Church. That's the one, and it's in Corinth. He's there for a year and a half. It's in Corinth that he writes this letter back to the church at Thessalonica, this little church that he helped to establish, that he had a deep love for. He writes back to them, and uh, there there are really four reasons that Paul has for writing this letter. In fact, if we can pop those up. The first reason he wrote this letter is that he wanted to express his thankfulness and his love and his care and his concern for this church. So in chapter 1, he just says how thankful he is to God, how much he loves this church, and how excited he is about what God's doing in their midst. That's his first reason for writing. Secondly, he knows that these people are that people in the city are continuing to slander him, and so Paul is writing to defend the character of his ministry. Uh, he's defending himself. He's addressing the slander that has been leveled against him. Chapters 2 and 3, he's explaining why the slander doesn't stick. He's explaining that their, their uh, cause was pure. That's the second reason he writes. Third reason he writes is that he knows this little church is experiencing ongoing persecution from the Jews and the pagans in Thessalonica. Uh, Thessalonica. He wants to remind them that opposition with Christianity is par for the course. It goes with the territory. You come to faith, do not expect to live a trouble-free life. Do not expect the culture to embrace what you're, you're doing. So these people are experiencing hardship and persecution from the culture around them. He says, I get that everywhere I go. And then the fourth reason he writes is there are specific spiritual issues, specific theological issues. Maybe Timothy has come back to him and said, when I was with the church, they shared with me some questions that they'd like answered. So Paul writes to them about things like the, the second coming of Christ. He writes to them about uh, uh, personal integrity and morality. We'll see that as we get to chapters 4 and 5. So those are the reasons that Paul writes this letter. That's the context. I want us this morning just to look at the first three verses of the letter to, the, to 1 Thessalonians. That's because verse 4 gets hard, and I'm leaving that for Rick Houck to teach next week, okay? But I just went to the easy ones and said, we'll leave the hard verses for Rick next week, all right? This letter, by the way, starts, you can turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. This is a letter that starts the same way that most letters in the ancient world started. The letters in the ancient world were written more like we write memos today. When you write a memo today, you write to so-and-so, from so-and-so, subject this. And then there may be some kind of a greeting that you write, dear so-and-so. That's how we do memos. When we do letters, we say, dear so-and-so, and then we go into the letter, and at the end we say, yours truly, and you write it up. But every one of us knows before we read the letter, we look and see what? Who's the letter from? So in the ancient world, they start off, they say, here's who it's from, here's who it's to, here's the subject matter or the greeting. So this starts with, here's who it's from, the authors of the letter, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Paul is the principal writer of this letter, but it comes to the church 
from the heart of all three of these men. Here's just, I, I mentioned already, Silvanus and, and Silas are the same guy. Remember Paul and Silas were in jail in Philippi. Luke always calls Silvanus Silas. Paul always calls him Silvanus. So it's just, it's the same person. And just as an interesting little aside, Silvanus, the name means the woodlands or the god of the woodlands. And Penn, Sylvania, means William Penn's woods. That's where the state got its name. So Sylvanus, the wood area, that's for free. There's nothing theologically profound about that, okay? So it's Paul and Sylvanus or Silas, and then Timothy, who has joined the group. Remember, he was in Lystra. He's a young man who was a convert uh, to Christianity, a Greek young man. He's a protege to Paul and Silas as they're going in to this area. So that's who the letter's from, Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy. The next thing the letter includes is who it's addressed to. It is to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, let me do some explanation here just so we get it. The, the church, the ecclesia, the, 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 uh, the Greek word here for church is really the word for the assembly. It, it was more often used in a secular context to talk about a political meeting. So you would have an ecclesia to discuss civic matters in, in this area. This was the, the, the word literally means the ones who are called out, the ones who are, are a subset of the bigger group. So this is the meeting or the assembly of a group of Thessalonians, and what differentiates them from the other Thessalonians is that they are the group that is in God the Father and in Christ Jesus. They're the first assembly of Thessalonica. They are not pagans, they're in God the Father, and they're not Jews, they're in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the differentiation that Paul is making. Being in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're so familiar with hearing those words as a greeting from the Apostle Paul that we kind of skip over that, but those words are loaded with meaning. First of all, they tie together, Paul is tying together that God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are equal, that, that they are on the same plane. They are in God and in Christ that's really declaring that God is Father of all creation. Jesus is both Messiah and Lord, and tying the two together with equal authority. And, and to be in God, to be in Christ, means that you have been called into the family of God. You, to be, you know, we talk about being like, like if uh, you had asked me, where were you last weekend? I was in Portland. I was geographically located in Portland last Sunday. That's where I dwelled. That's where I lived. I was subject to the laws of the city of Portland. I ate the food of Portland, including some donuts that were pretty good. I'll just say that, okay? I was, I was in Portland. That's where I dwelled. Here, they are in Christ and in God, which means not geographically, but it means relationally, they're a part of this family of, of God. They've been brought into this bigger family. The reason that they were brought in, to they are in Christ and in God, is because they have believed and they have committed themselves to the truth that Paul was preaching, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe should not perish but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. They heard that, they believed it, and that brought them into the family. That's the good news that they heard and embraced. They turned from their sins, they turned from their paganism, they turned from the, their old values, and they said, we commit ourselves to be a part of this family. Let me just say, being part of a local church in their day was different than being part of a local church in our day. There was no cultural pressure to go to church. These were not people who, you know, when they moved to town, they said, gee, what church should we go to? There wasn't a, there, there wasn't a groundswell. There was no social blessing that comes with being in church. In fact, for them to affiliate and unite themselves with this group of Christians was actually putting themselves on the outs with the culture that they were a part of. 
They, they, they didn't go to church so that they could do business deals. They didn't go to church so that they could have their name li listed in the church directory. And uh, they were not in Christ because they were tithers. This was about these people changing their orientation and their perspective. This was about people having a new purpose and a new meaning for life. Uh, they, they didn't do it because it was a civic duty. They trusted what Paul had said, and it mattered. And I hope, by the way, that's why you're here today. I hope you know that you're in the family of God, that you're in God, that you're in Christ. I hope you're not here because it's ritual or custom to do so or because you think there's a civic responsibility to do this. I hope you're here because the family gets together and the family talks about what our Father wants us to be about. If, if you have questions or doubts about being in the family of God, I hope we can talk about that. So Paul, Silas, Timothy, writing to the called out ones, the assembly in Thessalonica, the people who are in God the Father and in Jesus Christ our Lord. And then we have this greeting. Typically in the ancient world, you'd start a letter like this. You would start with greetings. That was the typical word that they would use to start a letter, greetings, or uh, or a, a wish of blessing. There'd be some kind of a, I hope you're doing well. But most often it was greetings. Paul decides rather than just adopting greetings, he decides to load it with some theological significance. And he says, grace to you and peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, he is really taking this core idea of God's graciousness, God's uh, blessing that we don't deserve. He's expressing this as their greeting. And then peace, the Hebrew word shalom, he's really combining the Gentile, he, he's upping the game on the Gentile greeting. He's taking the Hebrew greeting of shalom and saying grace and peace are found in Christ. That's how this letter begins. He says grace and peace. God's unmerited favor is yours. God's peace is yours in Christ. That's how he starts the letter. So the letter begins, verse 2, where Paul says, We, the three of us, give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what I want to do. I just don't want to draw your attention to four four ideas, four things that jump out at me from these two verses that tell us about Paul, tell us about the church, tell us about what's going on here. Here's the first thing I want us to see. When Paul prays for the people he loves, his first impulse with them is to thank God for them. When Paul is interceding for the people he loves, his first impulse is to thank God for them. This is what Paul does as he starts Romans. He says to the Romans, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. When he starts 1 Corinthians, I give thanks to my God always for you, because the grace of God was given to you in Christ Jesus. When he starts Philippians, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. When he starts Colossians, I, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray for you. This was Paul's pattern. We often talk about the Acts acrostic for prayer, that you should follow a pattern of adoration and then confession and then thanksgiving and then supplication or request, A-C-T-S. You've heard that acrostic, right? So, and by the way, I think that's a good pattern. I think in personal prayer, it's good to start with praise and worship to God. I think it's good to confess our sins to God. But when, when there's intercession going on, Paul's pattern was to begin his intercession for others with what he's thankful for. When he's thinking about others, the first thing he's thinking is, what am I thankful about for them? That's a good frame of mind for us to get into when we think about our relationships with one another in the body of Christ. If our first impulse is not, what do I dislike about that person? What do, where, where do I disagree with that person? Where, where do I want to fix that person? But instead, our first impulse is, what am I thankful to God for in the life of that person? What can I thank the Lord for that I see present in that person? I think that is a healthier, better place to start in our prayers for one another. 
I'm thankful to God for you. These churches that Paul's writing to where he says, I thank God for you, these are not perfect churches. They're not perfect people. God has a lot to say to them about where they're messing up through Paul, right? I mean, to go to the Corinthian church that's in a moral swamp and to say, I thank God for you, I mean, a lot of us would go, you, you can't start that way. You've got to start with, the, your, this, your church is a mess. But Paul says, I thank God when I think about you. He starts with thanksgiving. I think that's a good place for us to start in our relationships with one another. Second thing I see here is that Paul and his companions take prayer seriously. He says, we give thanks always. We are constantly remembering you before God. Near the end of this letter, Paul will say to them, pray without ceasing. We read that and go, what is it? Pray without ceasing. How do, does, how, how do you do that? Well, what it means is pray every time you have an opportunity, every time it presents itself, and do so with a constant attitude of dependence on God. That's what Strong says that verse means. You pray every time an opportunity presents itself, and you're in a constant attitude of dependence on God. That's how Paul and Silas and Timothy approached it. They're in Corinth. They can't do anything about what's going on with this church at Thessalonica except pray for them. And Paul says, that's okay. We pray regularly for you. And we pray for you, each of you. That means by name. He was praying specifically for Jason. He was praying specifically for other people he had met there. He's praying individually for them. He's doing it regularly. He's doing it constantly. These people were obviously on Paul's heart and mind regularly. Whenever they came to mind, his first impulse was to pray for them, to express confidence that God cared about these people even more than Paul himself did. When God brings people to mind, when God puts people on your heart, do you have a first impulse just to pray for them and to say, Lord, first of all, thank you for that person? You brought them to my mind, thank you that they are, and then to intercede for them and to pray regularly and to pray constantly. This, this was not a ritual for Paul. This was a part of the rhythm of his life. Somebody comes to mind, I, you have this happen, I have this happen. You just, you're driving to work, you think about somebody. You, you think about some circumstance in their life. Is the impulse just to stop right there and say, Lord, be with this person. I know what they're going through. It's tough. Be, help them. That's the constancy of prayer that was characteristic of Paul and the disciples. And we see that at the beginning of this letter. Here's the third thing I see here. Paul talks about faith, love, and hope. And I, I see in here that love and hope have got to be anchored first in a solid faith. I think there, there's a reason faith is the first thing he addresses. These three words, faith, Love and hope, three words we're really familiar with, right? Because of 1 Corinthians 13 that says, now these three things abide, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Paul has a different order for them here. And I don't think he's saying that uh, here he thinks hope is the greatest. I think what he's saying here is that there is a, a chronological source to this. But I think he's saying that faith is the soil from which love and hope grow. Love and hope have to be grounded first in faith. Love and hope apart from faith have as their source something other than God and have as their objective something other than the glory of God. And so love and hope apart from faith are beneficial temporarily but not eternally. Do you, do you see this? Do you see why there can be somebody who is a loving person or a hopeful person if it's not grounded in faith. It's a temporary, transient love and faith, and it doesn't give God glory because it's not grounded in a faith in Him. If, if faith and hope are fruit of the Spirit, or excuse me, if love and hope are fruit of the Spirit, Faith is the soil from which they grow. Why, why is love greater than faith? Well, because the apple is greater than the soil that it grows in, but the apple would never exist if it weren't for the soil, right? We, we, if, if you go to the store and there's a crate of apples and there's a box of dirt, the greater of those is the apples. But the apples wouldn't be there without the dirt, 
So there's got to be this foundation. He, he, if, if you want to grow in love for God and others, if you want to grow in hope for God's plan, you grow in faith. The more you grow in understanding who God is, understanding His plan and His purposes, the more you get to know Him, the more you get to love Him, love and hope will be the fruit that will come out of the soil of that faith. You want more love? Get more faith. You want more hope? Get more faith. Here's the last thing. It's not enough just to have faith, hope, and love. You also need a faith that produces works, a love that labors, and a hope that perseveres. Look back at verse 3, because that's exactly what he says. He says, he thanks God for their faith that produces works, their labor of love, and their steadfast, or their persevering, hope. He tells them that he's grateful for their work of faith. He's grateful not simply because they believe what they believe. He's grateful because what they believe is evidencing itself in how they live, in their activities and their actions. Paul and James agree on this. They do not disagree. Some people say, well, Paul believes in faith. James believes in works. No, Paul believes in a faith that produces activity and actions of work. That's what he's saying right here. He says, I thank God for your work of faith. He's grateful that what they say they believe about God actually makes a difference in how they live, in the activities of their lives. He expects real faith will manifest itself in how they live. And the same is true for love. He says, I, I thank God for your labor of love. There's a difference here. The word that's used to talk about the work of faith is the word ergon. It, it's the word we get energy. It's the word for uh, uh, ergonomics. It's, it's the word that just talks about activity. So I'm thankful for the activity of your faith. But when he gets to the word for love, he uses a word that means toil, labor, or wearisome effort. So I'm thankful that you have activities of faith, but I'm thankful that you have sacrificial, exhausting labor of love. Faith leads to faith-filled activities and actions, but a love that produces wearisome labor and toil in caring for the needs of others, that's the kind of love this church has, a love that is characterized by sacrificial action and effort. Remember in The Sound of Music, when Maria said, a bell is no bell till you ring it, a song is no song till you sing it, and love isn't love. Uh, no, what is it? Love in your heart wasn't put there to stay. Love isn't love till you give it away. Love isn't love if it's in here. Love is only love when there is a labor of love that demonstrates it to others. I think what Paul is commending this church for is the love that gives itself away, a love that labors hard to serve others final virtue is this virtue of hope, a hope that is steadfast or perseveres. It doesn't drift. It doesn't fade. It doesn't lapse in the face of a trial. It's not that we're hopeful until something bad happens and then we lose hope. This is a church that perseveres in hope even in the face of persecution and trial, which they're experiencing right here. Even when your personal circumstances don't give you a reason for hope, you have a hope that endures. They did. People often say, you know, it's the thought that counts, right? It's what's in your heart that really matters. What Paul is saying here is that what matters is more than just having the right thoughts or the right feelings. What matters is an active faith, a faith that works, a, a sacrificial, genuine love that demonstrates itself in laboring for the needs of others, and a secure hope that does not drift or fade but stays strong when things get tough. Now, I mentioned at the start of today's message that if there was a letter that I thought we could send to us, that I would send to us, really be between Philippians and 1 Thessalonians would be the ones I'd pick. And here's the reason for that. Let me explain why. When I travel like I did last week, I was, I was in Oregon last uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, flew to Michigan on Sunday. I was there Sunday night, Monday, and Tuesday before I came home. And when I'm traveling like that, I'm often with friends who know about the work that we do at Family Life and who know about this church. Friends will often say to me, how are things at Redeemer? What's going on at Redeemer? They want to know about what God is doing at this church. So if somebody asks you, how are things at Redeemer? 
What, what's going on at Redeemer? You, you, need to know, you need to know most of the time when pastors or elders get asked a question like that, there's this default switch in your head that goes to, let's see, I need to either report that attendance is up, giving is up, we have a building campaign going on, or uh, we've added staff. I mean, that's what, they, that's what they think. That's how you report on the metrics of how is, how's your church doing? Well, we've added new members. We've baptized more people. We, we're having to expand because of this. We're having to add. New, these are the kinds of things that we default to. And, of course, when people ask me how are things at Redeemer, I can't really say much about any of those things, right? But I always say it's great, and here's why. I'm watching people who really do love and care for one another. When people have needs, they're sacrificial in meeting those needs. I'm seeing people who are praying regularly for others. I'm seeing the labor of love. I'm seeing the work of faith. I'm seeing the endurance of hope in the midst of hard circumstances that God is putting people through. And, I'm, and I also I always had, and God has been gracious to protect us from division and dissension as a church and to maintain unity and peace in the church, which I don't take for granted because I've been in churches where that's not the case. So I say it's going great. Not because of the circumstances. I don't know if the Thessalonians had a building campaign going on or if they'd added a youth pastor at this point, right? But I do know that it was going great because of their work of faith, their labor of love, and their perseverance in hope. Let me just say, there's nothing wrong with a building campaign or adding staff. There's nothing wrong with reporting on increased people coming to your church. I think all of that's fine. I just don't think it's the central thing that we use to di diagnose the health of a church. In fact, I want to point one other verse out to you as we wrap up, and that's 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1. Because this would be a verse that I think I would say is true. Paul would, I, I think Paul would write this to us at Redeemer. Finally then, brothers, he says, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. You're already doing what you've been taught to do. Praise the Lord for that. Now do it more. That's what I think about when I think about Redeemer. People who are serious in their faith, people who labor in love, people who endure in hope. You care about living your lives in a way that pleases God and that serves others. And my prayer is that you would keep doing that more and more. And that's what brings us to the Lord's table, which is the table of grace where we find the strength we need to be the people God's called us to be. It's not that this cracker we're about to eat or that this thimble of grape juice is going to give us physical sustenance. But what these symbols represent to us, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, what these symbols represent are the source of strength and hope and life for us. And that's why as we come to the table, we come expectant of God's grace, expecting to receive the sustenance we need to be the people He's called us to be and to do the work He's called us to do. We practice open communion here at Redeemer, which means all who love Christ are welcome at this table. If you're in the family, if you know that you're a part of the family of God, you're welcome to come and receive the bread and the cup and to receive God's grace as you come. If you're here this morning as a visitor, or if you're here this morning and you say, as I look at my life, I don't know that I'm in the family of God. I don't know that, that I've really settled the issue of my faith in Christ. Then rather than coming and receiving this morning, I'd encourage you to uh, talk with me or to talk with one of the elders about how you can have confidence of, uh, that you're a part of the family of God and how you can be uh, a, a Christian. We can talk about that. So let's take a minute here. Let's prepare our hearts to come. And uh, as we get the elements ready, you pray. And in just a few minutes, we'll have you come down these outer aisles, receive the uh, cup and the bread, take them back through the center aisle to your seat and we will take the elements together here in just a minute.
Jesus on the night before he was crucified had the Passover meal with his disciples. And as he took the bread that evening, he blessed it, he broke it, he passed it to his disciples. He said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you do this, celebrate, take food together, as often as you come together, remember me. So Lord, this morning as we come and as we feast on your word, as we worship you, as we pray and seek your grace in our lives, we do pause to remember the sacrifice you made that we might be forgiven, restored, and that we might have a hope in the future. We receive this bread with grateful hearts. Amen. When the Passover meal was over, Jesus took the cup, and having prayed a prayer of blessing, he passed it. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, the covenant of my blood shed for the remission of your sins. And as often as you receive this, remember me. And so, Lord, this morning, we remember your shed blood. We remember that our sin, which was scarlet, is now white as snow. That you remember our sins no more because they are covered in grace by the blood of Christ. And we receive this cup with grateful hearts. Amen. Let's stand now and we will sing just that chorus lest I forget Gethsemane, and I'll dismiss us with a benediction here. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget this morning with one of two benedictions found in 1 Thessalonians, this one from the end of chapter 3. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. See you next week.